latest arguments used by evolutionists to support universal common descent are what are called ERVs. ERV stands for endogenous retrovirus. The idea is that these are ancient retroviruses that infected ancestral host cells that were passed on to offspring. Some go as far as to claim that this is a slam dunk case for universal common descent. The problem is that such claims ignore the assumptions not only behind the claim, but behind the research as well. As is typical in these cases, there are many details that are being overlooked. This argument actually takes several forms, from simply being evidence for universal common descent to being slam dunk proof of universal common descent. However, the basic argument goes as follows. Our genome and that of other species, such as chimpanzees, are loaded with androgynous retroviruses that could only have come about by common descent. It usually includes a claim that there are all these ERVs in the same place and that the odds are too small for them to be there by coincidence. The estimate of the odds are usually based on the size of the human genome, which is 3.8 billion nucleotides, along with the assumption that the insertions are totally random. They also ignore the effect of multiple insertions on the odds of getting duplicate insertions. The exact odds that are given varies with the version of the argument. Also within the variations are differences in the number of ERVs and the number we share in the same place with chimps. It is ironic for evolutionists to be using ultra-small probabilities to support their claim, given the ultra-astronomically small odds they themselves need to overcome for Big Bang to man evolution to work. What follows is a list of assumptions on which this argument is based. Evolutionists will often claim they are not assumptions but proven facts. However, in each case, they are merely assumed to be proven fact because they are seen that way by evolutionists. Each one of these will be dealt with in more detail in separate sections of this video. The first assumption is universal common descent evolution. The second is that they are ERVs. Third is that ERVs have an independent origin. That ERVs are non-functional. ERVs are selectively neutral. ERVs are inserted into genomes randomly. The probability of getting ERVs in the same location in more than one genome is too small to result from chance. That there is no creation model that can explain or predict the pattern of ERVs. One of the big problems with this line of research is that of actually tracking down the facts. There is surprisingly very little direct evidence to work with. There are no papers from which the actual number of ERVs we have, let alone how many we have in common with chimpanzees, nor how many we might have in the same location can be found. One problem is that the language that is used is not straightforward. Nowhere does there seem to be a paper that specifically indicates that we have any ERVs at the same location with chimpanzees. They use terms like orthogonous, which denotes they are considered to be a result of common ancestry, but not necessarily that they are in the same place. Here is an example of the variety that I have found. Number of ERVs, 200,000 or 98,000. The most likely explanation for this difference is the fact that we have two sets of each chromosome. And 98,000 times 2 is 196,000, which rounds to 200,000. One reason why this might be used by some promoters of this argument is that the 200,000 figure makes better propaganda. The number of ERVs at the same location as chimpanzees, 7, 14, 16, 97,915, that's 98,000 minus 85, or 99.9%, .9%, and 199,915, or 200,000 minus 85 for 99.9%. .9%. The 7 and 14 figures could also result from the fact that we have two copies of each chromosome. The last two are based on subtracting the number of ERVs unique to human beings, approximately 85, from the total and assuming that all of the others are the same location as those of chimpanzees. It is also estimated that only about 50 to 60 are intact ERVs, 
sequences, and that the rest are just fragments that contain ERV-like nucleotide sequences. The 200,000 with 99.9% .9 in the same place as the chimpanzees claim seem to have originated with Richard Dawkins. However, the reference he gives makes no such claim. The fact that this one is not valid should be clear based on how the figures are calculated. Also, the amount of variation that is shown between chimp and humans in the sequences in the paper he referred to also invalidates his claim. The best conclusion that can be drawn is that there are a total of 89,000 sequences that contain ERV-like sequences with only 50 to 60 of them being complete sequences and seven of which happen to line up with those of chimpanzees. However, this cannot be certain because the term orthogonous is used rather than specifically saying that they are in the same place. This could mean that the actual number of ERV sequences that are in the same location in humans and chimpanzee genomes could actually be zero, since there is no actual data presented that shows this is not the case. This is not a case of denying evidence, because there is really no evidence to deny. What we have is a mixture of claims, none of which are supported by peer-reviewed papers, nor found in their data. Universal Common Descent Evolution the problem here is not that everyone who makes this argument is assuming universal common descent. The problem is that the research on which the argument is based is assuming universal common descent. It still results in arguing in a circle. This problem boils down to the fact of the terminology used, as well as including terms like orthogonous, which only denote that they are considered to be a result of common ancestry. The simple fact is that none of the available research says anything about the actual location of ERVs with respect to each other. What is available does say that these ERVs are orthogonous and has such are evidence for common descent. However, such an argument is circular reasoning. It also provides no objective information on which to analyze these ERVs, making the lack of objective information the most noticeable aspect of this topic. The first thing that needs to be noted is the fact that the overwhelming majority of so-called ERVs are not complete sequences, but rather highly fragmented sequences. M most of these ERVs are long terminal repeats, transcription promoters, also known as LTRs. The condition of these ERVs suggests the possibility that they may not really be ERVs. This is not a question of competence or even methodology. This is more of a question of the presuppositions behind labeling these sequences ERVs. The interpretation is being made from an evolutionary and atheistic perspective, according to which there is no such thing as original genome content, meaning that the only source of these sequences would be that they are ERVs. From a design perspective, these LTRs could have been an original part of our genomes. This could be the case whether it is encoding, formatting, or otherwise regulating information. Put simply, if the ERV interpretation is wrong, the entire argument falls apart. As a result, the interpretation of these sequences as ERVs is a critical assumption of the argument. Given the fact that they are fragmented, with even LTRs being in less than perfect condition for true LTRs, it is quite possible that they are not really ERVs. This possibility is enhanced by the fact that we still have a lot to learn about genetics and how it works. From a design perspective, it is quite easy to see these elements as encoding, regulating, and formatting in ways we have yet to discover as part of the design. Assumption number three, ERVs have an independent origin. Yet another assumption is that retroviruses have an independent origin from humans and other organisms. If this were not the case, the genetic sequence they came from could have easily been our own genome. From an evolutionary perspective, this would not have been possible. We would not have existed when these viruses first formed. From a creationist perspective, it is quite possible because humans and animals could have pre-existed the viruses. One of the consequences of such a model is that we would expect to find retrovirus-like sequences in human and animal genomes that were not actually viral in origin. 
In such cases, they could easily be transposable elements gone rogue. The feasibility of this is backed up by virologist Dr. Ajnet Roberts. From a biblical perspective, this could have occurred at the fall. The next assumption is that ERVs are non-functional. One of the primary presuppositions of this claim is that the so-called ERVs are non-functional. This is based on the fact that they do not code for proteins and they are not capable of moving around or producing new viruses. It turns out, however, that they are functional because these sequences serve important regulatory and formatting functions. As a result, the claim that the sequences are not functional can be demonstrated to be false. This means that one of the prime assumptions of this claim is wrong. One of the most important assumptions of this claim is that ERVs are selectively neutral. What this means is that natural selection cannot select for or against the sequences. Not only would this be a natural result of them being non-functional, it would also be the only way they could have hung around for millions of years. The flaw in this is that evidence shows these sequences are indeed functional. Because of this, they are not selectively neutral, meaning that they can be selected out of the genome. This provides another explanation for having the same ERVs in the same location. Another primary assumption of this claim is that ERVs would insert themselves completely at random within the genome. Even if they do today, based on the fact that under biblical creation, deterioration has been going on since the fall, it is quite possible that they could have targeted specific locations within a gene when it was being attacked. Here is an example from the HIV virus. There are definite signs of clustering within this map of where it can be found inserted within the human genome. In fact, there are multiple locations where the insertions are in the same location within the margin of error of the graph. This illustrates the fact that even if viruses have a degree of randomness to how they insert themselves, they are not totally random. This by itself goes a long way to destroying this claim because at the very least, it greatly reduces the odds of having the same virus in the same place. A central piece of the claim that ERVs are proof of common descent is the notion that the odds of having so many ERVs in the same location is too small to be explained any other way. This not only assumes that insertions are completely random, they also assume only one infection. Not just one infection event, but only one infection. If as according to the claim, the virus can insert itself randomly any place in the genome, then the odds of getting an infection in the same place would be one in 3.8 billion. Those are pretty low odds. If, however, you have a million infections, then the odds of getting an infection in the same location are 1 in 3,800. That's a whole lot better odds. However, if the virus can only insert itself in one-tenth of the locations, then those odds drop to 1 in 380. For 1 in 100 locations, the odds are 1 in 38. And for 1 in 1,000 locations, the odds drop to 1 in 3.8. All of a sudden, this does not seem very improbable. If we up the number of infections to 10 million, now remember, this could be over multiple generations, the odds of getting a completely random infection in the same location drop to 1 in 380. If the number of possible locations are 1 in 10, then the odds are 1 in 38. 1 in 100 locations produces odds of 1 in 3.8 and one in a thousand locations results in a guarantee of getting infections in the same location. Finally, if you have a hundred million infections, once again, this can be over multiple generations, the odds of getting the same location with completely random infections becomes one in 38. With one in 10 locations possible for infection, the odds of getting an infection in the same location become one in 3.8. And in the cases where you have one in a hundred locations or one in a thousand locations, it becomes guaranteed that you will have infections in the same location. These calculations assume the ERVs are actually in the same place. The use of terms like orthogonous, which denotes they are considered to be a result of common ancestry, suggests they may not be in the same place. If this is the case, the entire argument is pointless because it would not be evidence for common descent and circular reasoning to claim that it is. 
Assuming the observed ERVs are actually in the same place, then you have to get rid of the extra infections. Ironically, evolutionists accept a mechanism for doing just that. That mechanism is natural selection. If any ERV is only safe or does not interfere with fertility in only one location, then all of the others will be filtered out. As long as the one we observe is the least harmful position for the ERV to be in, natural selection should filter out the other locations. The result is that even if the sequences are ERVs, it does not require common descent to have ERVs in the same location. Creation science offers three models that can explain the ERV patterns observed. It needs to be noted that none of these models are mutually exclusive. It is quite possible that all three of them represent at least some of the reported ERVs. Number one, they are not actually ERVs, but sequences whose code is sufficiently similar to that of an ERV that they are being mistaken for them because of an atheistic bias. This is most likely the case for fragmented segments where the similarities coupled with atheistic presuppositions lead to the conclusion that they are indeed fragmented ERVs. In such cases, they would be functional DNA code that has the location it does by God's design. Number two, they are actually ERVs, but they originally targeted specific code patterns for insertion. This would be a likely result of the theory that the viruses were originally designed to be helpful DNA transfer mechanisms that following the fall, some of them went rogue, mutating and causing disease. This could easily explain any ERVs that are in exactly the same location in unrelated organisms that have segments of common DNA. Number three, viruses tend to embed themselves in specific regions and most of the possible locations cause diseases that prevent them from being passed on to offspring. In such cases, you would have multiple infections in different locations within a population, but those that killed or otherwise hindered or prevented reproduction would get filtered out. In this case, the evolutionist's favorite magic wand of natural selection would help filter out ERV insertions in most places, leaving a high probability of ERVs in the same or nearly the same location. There are several predictions that can be made about the pattern we would expect to see in generating polygenic trees for ERVs. Number one, we would expect some of them to match the pattern predicted by common descent. Not only is this likely to occur by chance, but genetic similarity between organisms would tend to attract equally similar ERVs. Number two, many of the ERVs would not match the pattern predicted by common descent, but would produce polygenic trees that would suggest different lineages. This means that if the creation model is correct, we would expect to find some ERVs will fit common descent predictions, while others, possibly most, will not. If ERVs are a result of common descent, we should expect ERVs to produce a consistent pattern and one that is consistent with common descent. This graph shows what we should expect in general, as each species has a particular relationship with the next species or group of species. As can be seen in this chart, that pattern should be consistent. Not necessarily exact because there would be some variation, but they should be consistent and consistent with common descent. What we would expect to see based on common descent is a common branch coming along and splitting with one branch going towards the orangutan and the other going towards the rest of them. That branch would split off into gorillas and another branch that would split off into the remaining three. That branch would then split off to mankind and another branch going off to the two chimpanzee species. This line would then split off into bonobo and chimpanzees. For the record, from a creation standpoint, bonobo and chimpanzees are probably the same created kind because they are the same genus. As a result, if ERVs were the product of common descent, this is the pattern we should see across the board. In this chart, we have a perfect match to the evolutionary model, illustrating what we should expect from common descent. So which model fits the data the best? The following are collections of ERV polygenic trees that will be compared for the similarity to the common descent model and the creation model. If the common descent model is true, we would expect them all to match that model. If the creation model is correct, it should be mixed. While some will fit common descent, others will go against it. 
in the first one labeled 1Q23. The top one is a nice match for the common descent model. However, the second one does not. First of all, there is no evidence of this branch existing in orangutans, but the human and gorilla are almost directly across from each other. In fact, the way this one is drawn, it suggests that it suffers at least a little bit from a bias in favor of common descent. In this case, a look at the raw data may actually show it to be less in agreement with common descent than it appears. The second chart, labeled 3P25, is way off what is expected from common descent. First of all, the gorilla version is the most similar to human, with the orangutan being next in line. And chimpanzees and bobo have their own little branch. The lower one follows the same pattern, except that chimpanzees and bobos are completely absent. The chart 4Q32 fits common descent, except for the fact that there is nothing from either gorillas or orangutans. But in all fairness, that may just indicate a later infection. The second chart, labeled 6P22, is in general a pretty good fit to common descent. However, the top branch includes gibbons and orangutans, but the orangutans are missing from the second branch. From a common descent perspective, it would have required it to have been filtered out in orangutans. Here, the left-hand one labeled 11Q12, the bottom one does fit common descent. One, which is branch 5, doesn't quite match. It's close, but not quite. First of all, the gorilla branch is close enough that it may be a result of evolutionary bias. However, the branch separates between the bonobo and chimpanzee, with humans and bonobos being on the same side. This would tend to go against common descent. The right-hand one, labeled 19P13.11a, matches common descent on both the top and bottom, except for the fact that chimpanzees are absent. So either these lines are not a result of common descent, or they got filtered out of chimpanzees. Both of these fit creation models. On this one, the left one, labeled 19P13.11b, has humans on a separate branch from bobos, chimps, and gorillas. While the bottom one fits common descent, except for the fact that bobos and chimpanzees are missing. The one on the right, labeled 19Q13.1, however, does fit common descent, except for the fact that orangutans and gibbons are off on a branch together rather than separate branches that they should be. Here on the left, the graph labeled 6P21 does fit common descent, except for the fact that orangutans are earlier on the list than they should be, being before branching off into gibbons, baboons, and various monkeys. The chart on the right, labeled 9Q34.4, has gorillas and humans on the same branch, while chimps and bonobos are off on a separate branch, and orangutans are completely off. Here on the left-hand side, on the chart labeled 10P14, on the top, humans and gorillas are on the same branch, while bonobos and chimpanzees are on a different branch. On the bottom, humans are on a totally separate branch from bonobos, chimpanzees, and gorillas. The right-hand chart, labeled 12Q24, have two human variants, on totally separate branches from the gorilla, chimps, and bonobos. Neither of these fit common descent. Here on the left-hand chart, labeled 20Q11, variant 5 has chimps and bonobos on totally separate branches, with humans, gorillas, and orangutans closer together. The bottom one, labeled 3, however, does fit common descent. On the right, labeled A.HERV-KHML6-17, on the top branch, it is close to what you would expect from common descent. However, humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, their branches form a straight line, which is not expected with common descent. The bottom one is completely off from common descent because it has humans and gorillas on the same branch, along with chimpanzees and bobos on a separate branch, and orangutans and gibbons on the same branch. Here are the one on the left labeled B.HERV-K18. While the human and chimp branches 
are consistent with common descent. Both of the gorilla branches are completely off on a separate branch by themselves. In the one on the right labeled C.HERV-KC4, you have humans and orangutans, but there's no sign of bobos, chimps, and gorillas. In the one on the left labeled D.RTVL-LA, both sets are pretty close to what you'd expect from common descent. However, the human and gorilla branches split off evenly, with chimpanzees and bonobos having their own separate branch. The bottom one is almost the same, except gorillas are back a little bit, such that this one could have been influenced by evolutionary bias. On the chart on the right, on top, humans are on a separate branch from chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, which are off the same one. On the bottom, humans and gorillas shared the same branch, while chimpanzees and bonobos share a different one. It gets even worse for this one, which contains ERVs from humans, chimps, and rhesus monkeys. The pattern in this chart is not really consistent with common descent. In fact, it's rather mixed up. As can be seen in this enlargement of the upper half, they are all coming off of each other in a pattern totally unlike you would expect from common descent. And the bottom half is even more mixed up with all three just coming off of branches willy-nilly. There is no pattern here that is even close to what you would expect from common descent. By the way, you should note that the papers from which all of these charts come from were from papers that were given to me by evolutionists claiming that they supported common descent. As you look at these polygenic trees, there is no general pattern in the polygenic trees as you would expect from common descent. In fact, there is no general pattern at all, except the tendency towards randomness. This comparison shows it fits the creation model best. In conclusion, the claim is based on the presupposition that they are actually ERVs, that they insert randomly into DNA, that they are non-functional, that they are selectively neutral, and the odds of independently getting ERVs in the same location are astronomically small. In many ways, the claim presupposes common descent in the way these sequences are interpreted in the first place. This means that this claim is essentially a form of circular reasoning. Part of the problem is that none of these assumptions have been demonstrated to be true, and some can be demonstrated to be false. For example, these alleged DRVs are known to serve formatting functions for DNA. This makes it anything but non-functional, as well as subject to natural selection. Finally, it can be demonstrated that the production of polygenic trees for these ERVs lacks the consistency necessary to demonstrate that they are a result of common descent. Not only is the claim that ERVs prove common descent clearly busted by the evidence, but the evidence even goes against what would be expected if common descent were true. Once again, we have a claim made by evolutionists that does not stand up to the facts. This should not come as a surprise to any creationist who has actually studied this topic.